Well, good afternoon, everyone. So welcome to the 2019 Economic Forum. So at this time to establish protocol, I'm going to recognize some of our distinguished guests. The Honorable Moses Colonel, Acting Premier and Minister for District Administration, Tourism and Transport. He'll be joining us shortly. The Honorable Roy McTaggart, Minister for Finance and Economic Development. Mr. Alva Saku, Deputy Leader of the Opposition and elected member of Newlands. Barbara Conley, elected member for Georgetown South and Counselor for Education. David White, elected member for Georgetown West and Counselor for Sports and Transport. Kenneth Bryant, the elected member for Georgetown Central. Kenneth Jefferson, the Financial Secretary in the Ministry of Finance and Economic Development. Dr. Dax Basdeo, Chief Officer of the Ministry of Financial Services and Home Affairs. Michael Nixon, Senior Assistant Financial Secretary in the Ministry of Finance and Economic Development. And our elected Chamber of Council members include President Chris Kernel, President-elect Woody Foster, Vice President Mike Gibbs, Immediate Past President Paul Biles, and Councillor Nelson Dilbert. Put your hands together, please. <laughs> Welcome. So this time to move the agenda forward, I'm going to ask Gordon Phillip, the Managing Director of Cayman First, and our lunch sponsor to the podium. He's going to share some information about an initiative that the company is launching. We want to thank Cayman First for sponsoring this excellent buffet lunch and for supporting the forum for the second consecutive year. Thank you, Will, for the introduction. Uh, Cayman First is delighted once again to be part of the sponsorship team assisting the Chamber in uh, putting on this informative event. It's a second annual, and I think the numbers here in the room indicate that it's a very worthwhile addition to the, uh, the Chamber calendar, and probably one that's here to stay. So uh, let's hope so, and uh, we'll, we all like an afternoon off work, so you know, it's, a, it's a good thing. Uh, you'll be glad to hear from me that I'm not about to launch any sales pitch on our uh, Cayman First insurance products, but rather I just want to mention a charitable initiative that Cayman First are very proud of. It's not actually a new one. It's been going for uh, five years now, uh, and it's a, an employee company collaboration. We call it uh, Charities of First. It puts a, a modest amount, but not insignificant amount, into the coffers of a, a worthwhile charity every month, and what I'd like you to do is, um, with the, whoops, with these beautifully crafted pens that we've uh, provided for you, um, if you could put a beautifully handcrafted uh, mark in one of these boxes uh, to uh, to choose a charity. Later on, we will uh, gather up and tally the uh, the the uh, coasters, and uh, we'll make the winner our uh, 13th month for uh, recipient charity for um, our 2019 program. So very simple, pen, tick, or whatever, and we'll, uh, we'll take care of the rest. Uh, so very simple. Thank you very much for your participation, and enjoy the rest of the, uh, the forum. Oh, that's a pretty cool initiative. Thank you very much. Give him a round of applause. That's pretty cool. Thanks again, Gordon. So, obviously, you all come here for a reason. You probably were, you know, ex interested to understand what economic sustainability really is, right? So what I'm going to do is uh, to set the tone and just going to define what really economic sustainability is according to my limited research and my armchair economic understanding. So economic sustainability refers to practices that support long-term economic growth without negatively impacting social, environmental, and cultural aspects of the community. It has three main pillars, which are economic, environmental, and social. These three pillars are informally referred to as people, planet, and profits. When all three are balanced or aligned, one doesn't destroy the other. Today's forum topics will address these three main pillars. Each presenter will provide their perspective on the topic and when then will be joined in a panel discussion. Audience questions are encouraged. At each table, there are index cards and pens so that you can write down your questions. 
and I'll be circulating within, among the audience to collect your questions and direct them to the panel. So now we'd like to move into the official welcome. Serving as the elected president of the Chamber of Commerce is a significant responsibility for a busy business person. Chris Kernel is vice president of operations for Kirk Freeport and is actively involved in several other family businesses and other government appointed boards. Chris has taken time away from his business and his family and in fact traveled with me last week to Brazil to attend the World Chambers Congress. The trip allowed us to learn best practices in other chambers of commerce and to some of the issues that impact other societies. Please welcome Chris, who will deliver some welcome remarks and set the tone for today's forum. Thank you, Will, and thank you especially for setting protocol. It takes um, quite a bit to get through. We have so many uh, fantastic guests here, and we thank you all for, for attending with us today and for making the event what it is. I begin my opening remarks by thanking the Ministry of Finance and Economic Development, DART, the Department of Tourism, Cayman First, Coldwell Banker, and CUC for working with us to host the second economic forum. Engaging in a national conversation about the economy, its challenges, opportunities, and threats is a valuable annual exercise and aligns with the mission of the Chamber to support, promote, and protect the interests of the membership and the wider community. A robust economy creates jobs and helps to generate the income needed to provide the services that contribute to a higher standard of living for us all. Your attendance here demonstrates your commitment to our community and your interest in its future. During each session, we encourage you to take the opportunity to submit questions to the panels so that we can have an interactive conversation. The Chamber Council and I have chosen the theme economic sustainability because it is the backbone of business and of our society. Any organization or economy which is absent of sustainability is destined to, at some point or the other, fail. Sustainability is the name of the game. Economic sustainability addresses some of our island's most challenging issues, such as the pace and level of development, the protection of our environment and natural resources, the ongoing and future development of the main industry sectors, the introduction of new sectors, population growth, inward investment, affordable housing, and essential infrastructure. Social issues such as public safety, education standards, the curriculum in our schools, whether the scholarships distributed are aligned with the needs of our businesses, and the social interaction between Caymanians, residents, and guest workers are also important topics to address. Today's panel discussions will likely focus on a few key areas, the pace of development, access to labor, and population growth. There's no doubt that the Cayman Islands economy is growing. Construction sites are visible in many districts, and several proposed commercial, luxury, and residential developments are in the planning pipeline. Labor demands are at historic levels, triggered by a surge in construction, record increases in stayover tourism arrivals, and the economic substance requires requirements for the financial services sector. In March, the Chamber released an online survey to our membership, seeking views on the current rollover policy and its impact on their organizations. 111 member businesses responded to the survey from across all industry sectors, including micro, small, medium, and large businesses. The results were evenly divided, divided among sectors, and the findings sent the Council a clear message. Over 71% of the respondents say that they do not support the current term limit policy that requires for per, per, work permit holders to apply for permanent residency and leave the island, or leave the island after nine years. When asked what changes they would like to see in the system and why, members were very outspoken. As you can see, this affects companies in all various industries and sizes, but especially we found the most disruptive to smaller businesses. 
just going to read a couple of these quotes that stood out to kind of give you the feel of the overall views of the membership. This, the term limits, is disruptive to organizational stability, especially for small businesses who greatly depend upon their employees and do not have the advantage of cross-training or multiple people doing the same job. Total elimination of any mandatory rollover policy, at least for companies with fewer than 10 employees. Any rollover is a total disaster for small organizations, such as mine, with only one employee. Other quotes that came from members. A rollover not only means losing good people, through, only means losing good people to replace them with other expats. While the route to citizenship should be encouraged, subject to meeting certain minimum criteria, there should be an option to opt out, thereby enabling individuals to remain here, to, here subject to work permit, but without the obligation to pursue citizenship. Rollover does not increase available Cayman employees. It only costs us a highly trained employee. Rollover has no benefits to Caymanians or our businesses. Now again, these are comments that are from you, our members. This is not something that the Chamber or the Council has put together. These are how we are seeing the effect of the rollover policy um, in our businesses on a day-to-day -day basis. The survey findings generated considerable dis discussion and debate amongst the Council members and is likely to trigger strong feelings amongst this audience today. Whether you support the current system or not, chamber members want to reopen the discussion on the term limit policy to determine whether it is addressing the needs of our community or hampering business growth. Given the size and success of Cayman's economy compared to its Caymanian population, there really should be no woman, man, or child left behind. Responsible employers want to hire Caymanians as a priority but everything must be done to ensure that the workforce has the basic competencies, attitude, desire, and ability to succeed in today's competitive work environment. Cayman punches well above its weight in terms of the services that we provide to the world. We must remember this when we are preparing the workforce for the future. Academic excellence must become a priority for our public and private schools. We are failing future generations if we don't address educational standards and insist that no student leaves the school without a skill and, at minimum, the ability to read and write. I'm going to step away from the prepared speech a little bit just to, to get into that a little bit more. Because standing up here and declaring that a goal should be that children leave our school with the ability to read and write not only sounds like a given, but it's almost borderline insulting. But the fact of the matter is that we are sending our youth into the workforce every year without these fundamentals. Three years ago, when I joined the executive committee of the chamber, Kyle Broadhurst, who is the current president, made a huge effort to dig into the education system and to try to understand where our successes and our failures are. The shocking fact that started to resonate is that we have young people that after 15 years in our education system, are graduating without the ability to even write their names on a job application. We are failing our children, and we are not only dooming their future, but setting up to de destroy our own in the process. One of the presenters at the Congress uh, last week said something that really resonated. The biggest failing of a country is youth unemployment. Getting on to the point that every student should leave with a skill, something that I was able to bring back from the World Chamber Congress last week, is that we are not the only country where trade and vocational training is a need and a focus. There was a competition for the best education and training project, and four out of the five finalists were projects that all focused on either vocational training or identifying the skills of students before they enter the workforce. I look forward to spending some time with the government and the Minister of Education to share some of these findings as they, are, as they really are some amazing programs that could be adopted into what we do here in Cayman. Creating a sustainable economy requires open discussion across all sectors and segments of our society. The government's strategic policy statement sets out eight broad outcomes which include a strong economy that helps families and businesses, achieving full employment for jobs for all Caymanians, 
the best education opportunities for our, all of our children, reducing crime and fear of crime, access to quality, affordable health care, stronger communities and support for the most vulnerable, ensuring Caymanians benefit from a healthy environment, and stable, effective, and accountable government. But as has been said before, a goal without a plan is just a wish. We have several individual plans, projects, and departments that are all being enacted, such as Plan Cayman, the Georgetown Revitalization, and the newly introduced work program. But to the best of my understanding, what appears, what appears to be lacking is an overall strategy that ties all of these plans together. Such a national strategy would provide us with an agreed vision and framework for the Cayman Islands of the future, and what that would look like and would, and would help us to determine whether a society with 100,000 people or more is really want to eat what we want to achieve and when. Last week, Will and I attended the World Chambers Congress in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. The confer conference attracted chambers from across the globe to share best practices, to share information about their economies and new trends impacting global business. For me, it was an eye-opening eye experience. Rio is a beautiful city with an abundance of beaches, mountains, and natural resources. To be honest, Rio has one of the most beautiful and unique coastlines that I've ever seen. Standing on top of the Sugarloaf Mountain, you can see the intricate dance that unwinds between the mountains, the peaks that stretch down to the ocean, and the pockets of beautiful beaches, the names of which grace the, the, grace the lyrics of songs by legends like Frank Sinatra and Barry Manilow. But in the middle of this magical landscape, overdevelopment, overcrowding, poverty and crime have ruined the glow that this city once held. High-rise buildings are stacked together, casting shadows over the pockets of favelas filled with the poorest of the poor. Traffic conditions are unbearable, to the point that it took us over an hour and a half during rush hour to travel five miles. Crime in Brazil hit an all-time high in 2017 with over 61,000 murders. Things were so bad that the police control in Rio was handed over to the military in 2018. The point that really hit home to me was looking down at this absolutely stunning gem of nature and seeing how humans were able to practically destroy most of its worth. This is not something that any of us want to see happen to Cayman, but it will take proper planning, real sustainability goals, and a focused effort to, effort to develop not just for development's sake, but to do so in a way that benefits all of our people and at a pace that keeps Cayman special for future generations. I've spoken to many business people from all industries and companies of varying sizes, and an overwhelming consensus is that Cayman does not need to become a high-rise jungle. We are already pushing our limits with the current building height restrictions, and Caymanians from all walks of life, including members of the, ch of the Chamber Council, all seem to agree that a 50, 80, or 100-story skyscraper planted directly in the heart of Seven Mile Beach is not only not a sustainable way forward for our island, it is not needed nor wanted by the larger community. Coming back to the World Chambers Congress, the conference highlighted the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. These 17 goals with their 169 targets from the core of the 2030 UN Agenda. They balance the, ec the economic, social, and ecological dimensions of sustainable development and place the fight against poverty and sustainable development on the same agenda for the first time. These SDGs are to be achieved around the world and by all UN member states by 2030. This means that all states are called upon equally to play their part in finding shared solutions to the world's urgent challenges. While the Cayman Islands are not mandated to adopt the imp and implement these goals, it is important for us to understand what they are since they're all relevant to Cayman's economic sustainability. Please watch a short video which outlines these goals.
Most of the 17 goals align with our government's broad strategic policy statement, so it appears that we are on the right track to help in the UN's quest for sustainable development. In closing, I'm optimistic about Cayman's future, but we must work together to develop a shared vision that balances our economic success without sacrificing our quality of life. We must ensure that no one is left behind as we strive to develop a sustainable economy that provides opportunities for our children and their children. I hope that you all enjoy today's forum and thank you for being here with us this afternoon. I'd like to introduce the Minister, Minister McTaggart. The first presentation for the forum will address the state of government finances. The Honorable Roy McTaggart is a minister responsible for finance and economic development. Minister McTaggart worked for more than three decades in the public accounting, rising to the top position as managing partner as one, at one of the major accounting firms. He's devoted many years to public service on government boards and private sector organizations, including two years as an elected president of the Chamber of Commerce. Minister McTaggart is serving his second elected term of office. He was first elected in 2013 and served as counselor to the Ministry of Health and served as interim minister at times from 2013 to 2017. Please join me in welcoming Minister McTaggart.